In earlier screencasts, we've established a framework within which to understand human walking. In this screencast, we'll start to work within that framework. Earlier on, we identified five requirements of walking based on earlier work, particularly that of Inman, Gage and Perry. All three of them considered energy efficiency as an essential requirement of walking. Healthy human walking is actually incredibly energy efficient. An adult walking at a comfortable speed for a kilometre only uses up the energy equivalent of two level teaspoons of sugar. In energy terms, this is ten times as efficient as a modern car, although the car does travel a lot faster, of course. A healthy child needs to walk at a comfortable speed for over an hour to use up the energy contained in a can of Coke. It would be a lot easier not to drink the can of Coke in the first place, of course. As a general point here, walking at comfortable speed is so efficient that you have to walk for huge distances to achieve any meaningful weight loss. To lose weight, you really need to exercise more vigorously, or better still, not to consume so much energy in the first place. There are two main mechanisms that we use to achieve such energy efficiency, and they are both different types of pendulum. The first is the simple pendulum. Most of us have a good understanding of this, and can see that if the whole leg is allowed to swing freely from the hip joint, then it will swing backwards and forwards like a pendulum. In fact, not just like a pendulum, it is a pendulum. If we measure the joint angles of Vern standing on his left leg, with the right leg swinging backwards and forwards, then all the joint angles would be zero, apart from the right hip, which would show a sinusoidal variation, as depicted on the graphs here. We are all familiar with the energetics of a simple pendulum. I'll go through this in a little more detail than you may feel you need, however, in order that we can compare this with a different kind of pendulum in the next slide. When the pendulum is in an extreme position, its centre of mass is highest and it has maximum potential energy. As the pendulum descends, it loses potential energy as the centre of mass loses height and is minimal when the pendulum is vertical. It's moving at maximum speed by this time, so its momentum carries it through to rise on the other side until it has the same potential energy as it had to start with. The leg will then start to swing back and the cycle repeats. We could also track the kinetic energy. At the point when the potential energy is highest, the pendulum is stationary for an instant, so it has no kinetic energy. As it loses potential energy, it gains kinetic energy. The important thing is that as this occurs, there is no change in the total energy. A perfect pendulum would keep on swinging forever without using up any energy. One important thing about the simple pendulum is that it swings backwards and forwards, so that the horizontal component of its velocity varies between forwards, positive, and backwards, negative. Most of us probably know that the time for a perfect pendulum to oscillate depends only on its length and the acceleration due to gravity. Just to recap, in a simple pendulum, the mass is below the pivot. The pendulum conserves energy, there is a periodic oscillation, and this occurs at a specific natural frequency. Although the pendulum conserves energy, it isn't much good for walking because it doesn't move anywhere. In order to achieve movement, we need to consider what is called an inverted pendulum. It's called inverted because the mass is above the pivot, as opposed to below it for the simple pendulum. How do its characteristics compare to those of the simple pendulum? One difference is at the extreme position at the start of the movement. The potential here is at a minimum. As the pendulum moves forwards, it rises and gains potential energy, which will be at a maximum when the pendulum is vertical. Once the pendulum has passed this point, it loses height and thus loses potential energy. Given that the pendulum gains potential energy early on, it must start off with some kinetic energy. This will reduce as the potential energy increases, and if there is enough kinetic energy to start with, then the pendulum will pass over the midpoint. Just as in the simple pendulum, the total energy remains constant throughout the movement. If the pendulum doesn't have enough kinetic energy to start with, however, then it won't reach the vertical, but will slow until it stops and then start falling backwards. This is one difference with a simple pendulum. A simple pendulum will always work, even if it starts off with no kinetic energy. The inverted pendulum will only work if it has sufficient kinetic energy at the start of the movement to carry it over the midpoint.
The other main difference is that there is no oscillation. The pendulum never swings back if it's got enough energy. The horizontal component of velocity is always positive or forwards. In other words, the inverted pendulum is a mechanism for moving a mass forwards without requiring any energy. This is the mechanism that is at the heart of walking. In summary, in an inverted pendulum, the mass is above the pivot. The mechanism conserves energy, but there is no oscillation and hence no specific natural frequency. Most important for all, the inverted pendulum is an energy conserving mechanism that allows a mass to be moved forwards. In case you need convincing, look at this video. Fjelljepen, or canal vaulting, is a popular sport in the Netherlands. The jumper runs up to ensure that she has significant kinetic energy when she jumps onto the pole. Once on the pole, her mass is high up above the pole's pivot, which is in the mud at the bottom of the canal. In other words, we have an inverted pendulum. As the jumper arcs up, potential energy is gained and kinetic energy lost. The movement slows. But once over the high point, the pole starts to pick up speed again. In this case, the jumper has moved 15.55 metres forwards during the vault, a women's world record at the time. Ignore at the moment the way the jumper climbs up the pole in mid-vault. We'll come back to that in a later screencast. Clearly, the inverted pendulum can be a remarkably good mechanism for moving an object, the jumper, forwards from one place to another. Let's look in a little more detail at the inverted pendulum model of stance. If we look at the gate graphs on the left side, you'll see that they only span half the gate cycle because we're only modeling stance. If we just have a naively simple inverted pendulum, then the ankle will clearly move from a position of some plantar flexion in early stance through neutral to the same degree of dorsiflexion in late stance. We're assuming that the knees and hips don't move, which means that the pelvis and indeed the whole trunk will start off tilted backwards and end up tilted forwards. Obviously we can't walk like this or we'd all get seasick. The solution to this particular problem is quite obvious. We introduce a hip joint. This is a simple example of what I mean by starting with a simple movement and building in more and more complexity, although it's not particularly complex in this case. In many ways, we can see the purpose of the hip joint during walking as being to allow the head and trunk to remain upright while the legs move. In particular, to allow stance limb to act as an inverted pendulum. You can look at the left hand side here and see how the gait graphs have changed. If the hip angle is exactly opposite to the ankle angle, then the pelvis and trunk remain level. Note also that the hip angle throughout stance almost exactly matches that of normal walking on the basis of this one criteria. Whilst the movement pattern looks quite different, the energetics of the movement are almost identical to that of the simple inverted pendulum. The centre of mass of the trunk is immediately above the hip joint, and thus its trajectory matches the hip joint exactly, but is just a little higher. The movement thus has almost exactly the same interactions between kinetic and potential energy as a simple inverted pendulum. There are some subtle differences here, but we'll come back to those in a later screencast. I said earlier that I wanted to test the predictions of even the simplest models against real data. These graphs are just of the stance phase of gait. The grey areas at each side represent times of double support at the beginning and end of stance. I plotted the horizontal and vertical components of the velocity of the centre of mass. The black lines come from a simple inverted pendulum model of stance. The grey bands are the one standard deviation bands for normal walking taken from David Winter's book in keeping with my overall approach of building on the historical perspective. You'll see that the horizontal component graphs on top matches almost perfectly. The centre of mass has its maximum velocity at the start of stance as required by the inverted pendulum. The component reduces through mid stance as the centre of mass is raised as the limb moves to a vertical alignment. And then the velocity starts to increase again as the centre of mass falls in late stance and the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. The vertical component is plotted on the lower graph. As you can see, the match is good over the middle of stance, but not nearly so good at the beginning and end. At the moment, we'll just appreciate that, given how simple our model is, it's amazing how well the model and experimental data agree. Later on, we'll explore the differences.
Winter also includes data for slow walking and fast walking. Model predictions are equally good for the horizontal component, but the discrepancies at the beginning and end of stance increase as walking speed increases. Once we've got the movement of the stance phase limb, it is possible to add a swing phase limb which just mirrors the hip and ankle movement. If this is the case, then the swing foot will just slide along at floor level. We're going to have problems if we come across an obstacle, but it's possible to imagine this as a functional walking pattern on a flat surface. If we string the individual steps together, the walking pattern becomes even more convincing. If you think about it, this cape pattern is exactly the same as the compass gate that Inman and Eberhardt took as their starting point for the determinants of gait. Although drawn in three dimensions, all movement takes place in the sagittal plane, and the limb is just a pylon without a knee joint. It looks in this figure as if we have the stance limb acting as an inverted pendulum and the other limb acting as a simple pendulum. Perhaps we have discovered a way of walking that doesn't require any energy input at all. But we have to hold back a little bit. If we look at the gait graphs, this walking pattern requires the swing limb to have joint angles in blue that are the mirror image of those of the stance limb in red. It's only in this way that we achieve clearance. If the joint angles are equal and opposite, then so are the joint velocities. In other words, this means that the swing limb must vary its speed in exactly the same way as the stance limb. Thus, if the stance limb starts off moving quickly and slows down through mid-stance, as required by the inverted pendulum, the swing limb must do the same. This is exactly the opposite of what is required by a simple pendulum, which starts off with a low velocity and gets faster through mid-stance, and then slows again towards the end of swing. Thus, although the gait pattern looks plausible, the swing limb is not functioning as a simple pendulum, and this is not the energy-free walking that we might first have hoped for. The inverted pendulum gives us a reasonably good explanation of what is happening in stance, but we need to look at other factors to understand swing. This seems reasonable. Most of the mass of the body is in the head, arms and trunk. The inverted pendulum is an excellent mechanism for transporting that mass efficiently. The lower limb has only about a sixth the mass of the head, arms and trunk, and it should not surprise us that compromises are made in its movement to fit around the mechanism that is most efficient for the greater mass. In passing, it might be worth mentioning a growing number of very simple models of walking which are based on this inverted pendulum model with a mirror movement in the swing limb. These tend to assume that all the mass is in the head, arms and trunk, and that the legs don't carry any mass, in which case the problem doesn't arise. Of course, a bigger problem does arise, that they can't be applied to human walking where the limbs do have significant mass. So, in this screencast I hope we've explained the fundamental importance of two different types of pendulum for human walking. We've also seen that we can't be too simplistic. Walking does not just involve the swing limb acting as a single pendulum at the same time as the stance limb acts as an inverted pendulum. The laws of mechanics, Newton's laws, just don't work that way. To fully understand walking, we've still got quite a way to go. I did hope originally, however, that our modelling would have a clinical value. I think the first insight we get from what we've learned in this screencast is that in order for the inventive pendulum to work, it needs to start off with considerable kinetic energy. We will only walk efficiently if we start the gait cycle at speed. That requires a dynamic transition from one step to the next. In our gait rehabilitation, we need to focus on keeping the patient moving. Encouraging the patient to stop after each step in the double support phase before taking the next step may be important in the very early stages of rehabilitation when the patient needs to learn to balance. But as rehabilitation progresses, the focus should be to get the patient to pass more and more quickly through the double support phase that links the steps. In normal walking, the body moves at maximum speed when it is in double support, not minimum speed. In the next screencast, we'll look at how other requirements of walking require different patterns of movement. Let's finish off, though, by watching the canal vaulter one more time and remembering the power of the inverted pendulum.